Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you for this invitation to discuss the problems that confront the development of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The first point that I'm going to discuss is the economic performance of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Second, I will attempt to define what is currently inhibiting my country's economic progress. And the third question that I would like to tackle is the armed conflicts that are currently supported by our neighbors and prevent the development of the DRC. Regarding economic performance, I would like to tell you all today that the DRC is experiencing quite a remarkable economic resurgence. In terms of economic stabilization, we are bringing down the inflation rate that has historically weakened our country. In 2012, for example, we experienced an inflation rate of 2.7%, the lowest rate in over 30 years, as well as a nominal gross domestic product growth of 7.2%, while the population only increased by around 3%. Therefore, this growth is overall very positive. In 2013, while the year has only started, we estimate the nominal GDP growth to increase to 8.3% and the population to increase by 3%. In 2014, we expect to greatly surpass these economic growth figures. The progress we are now seeing, in terms of structural and economic reforms, will be maintained if these efforts produce the expected results, thereby allowing our country to surpass previous economic projections. Economic growth manifests most noticeably from the revival of physical infrastructure as it is capable of connecting the DRC's 2.3 million square kilometers. The hospitals are currently being renovated and schools are being constructed or rebuilt as well. We must acknowledge that this macroeconomic stability is quite exceptional. In terms of currency, the Congolese franc is on par with the U.S. dollar. However, our economic efforts are nonetheless impaired by security issues. Several researchers have shown that there is a relation, a causal connection between security and economic growth. All the results that I mentioned have happened in spite of the security challenges, especially in the East and in North Kivu. This insecurity does not allow the government to do what is necessary to improve the living conditions in that part of the country. This insecurity also takes away important resources that were meant to go towards the improvement of social conditions in the country. This war started in February of 2012, and we have already spent more than 150 U.S. dollars, 150 million U.S. dollars, which were directed towards military operations there. One can imagine that if this $150 million could be directed towards development projects, the living conditions of our people would improve greatly. These military operations prevented us from moving forward with the Millennium Development Goals, which you all know are giving us a metric to measure the social conditions of the population. To be sure, this war in the East is a war that is damaging and preventing us from progress. Different studies led by experts from the UN at the prompting of the Security Council have concluded that the armed groups in the East were armed by our neighbor, Rwanda. For us, this group report from the UN is a professional report, a serious report, and it is important for the international community and the United States to take into account this dramatic, serious situation where a rebellion is being fomented by a country that has the support of the international community. What I am saying is explained in a report made by the panel of experts from the UN. It is important to be able to say that the international community must examine carefully the causes of this insecurity because it causes human circumstances that are impossible to accept. Women are killed and children are enlisted into wars and armies and we must bring this situation to an end. Another medium for insecurity in the DRC is the external exploitation of the mining industry, as some of the Congo's neighboring countries continue to export mining resources beyond their actual capacities for production. The experts from the UN have identified the origin of this rebellion and point their fingers at Rwanda. Between 2010 and 2011, Rwanda exported more than 4,000 tons of minerals. That is more than the production capacity of that country. 
Rwanda has also exported more than 4,000 tons of cotton, which again is beyond its production capacity. Rwandan exports more than it produces. Therefore, in this context, it seems that rebellion and insecurity favor those countries' economies that are also supported by the international community. I want to tell you that the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is beholden to the idea of territorial integrity for our entire country and peace in the East. He also cares very much about the integrity of the operations. It is inconceivable that the international community tolerates the situation that has been identified by the United Nations. As for the negotiations in Kampala and Addis Ababa, we want these negotiations to be supported by all great political powers in the world, in particular the U.S. We believe that the success of these talks and the official tr and transparent support of the international community will directly contribute to the sustained successes of our economy. I thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for being late. Uh, I think the Washington Post yesterday said D.C. has the worst traffic problems uh, in the whole country, and I can test now <laughs> testify to that. But let me also very much thank the Wilson Center for organizing this program. We have very, very good collaboration, and we're especially appreciative of the opportunity that you gave Assistant Secretary Carson a couple of weeks ago mm. to kind of outline our policy towards Africa and, and towards the DRC. As the Assistant Secretary said in his testimony before Congress uh, in December, the security and humanitarian situation in the DRC is the most volatile and violent in Africa today. The people of North and South Kivu provinces have faced repeated cycles of conflict, atrocities, and displacement, with the current crisis simply being the latest iteration. And to underscore our very deep concern about the situation, the highest levels of the U.S. government have engaged the parties in the conflict and will remain engaged. We support a political dialogue with all relevant actors in pursuit of a permanent solution to the root causes of the conflict and instability in the region. We're hopeful that the UN and regional mediation efforts now underway will bear fruit. However, even once a regional framework agreement has been signed, the real road, the real road and progress lays ahead. The parties will need to engage seriously to identify and implement concrete measures to implement the principles contained in the framework agreement. Political will is absolutely necessary. It is in the interest of all the Congo's closest neighbors to support a stable and sovereign DRC. The world is too interconnected. And we all feel our neighbors' pains, and we're all responsible for the progress that our neighbors make. Peace in the Congo benefits everyone around it. A peaceful solution to the current conflict will create a secure atmosphere for good governance, economic growth, investment, and development. While these regional efforts are necessary, the DRC government itself has important challenges to resolve the achieved, sustained peace and stability, particularly in the reform of its security sector and the extension of effective governance to the eastern part of the DRC. The DRC government has already made some significant economic and financial reforms, and we give much of that credit to the uh, Prime Minister to improve its potential for economic growth development and a better quality of life for its citizens. Many of the reforms, as I just said, are attributable to the Prime Minister's efforts. Under his leadership, the DRC has cut inflation, stabilized its currency, revitalized cooperation with the international donor community, instituted mobile banking and direct payment systems to reduce the risk of corruption and payment of civil sal servant salaries and improve the business climate. This is particularly important in terms of payments to the military. We see this has been some of the problems in terms of the conflict in the Eastern DRC, the role of the military, so mobile payment systems we think is very important step in the uh, on the way to sustainable security sector reform. The United States greatly values our cooperation with PM Matata 
and the entire government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We were very pleased when the Prime Minister appointed you to the position of, uh, I'm sorry, when the President appointed <laughs> you to the position of Prime Minister in April of last year. You, he retains this appointment as Finance Minister, and we're looking forward to the continuing reforms under your, your leadership. Thank you. So now we can open it up for, for Q's and A's. <laughs> okay, thank you, Cynthia.